Governors hit back, say federal government's responsible for rising poverty and avoid emotion that can destroy or passenger urges Nigerians. This is Plus Politics. My name is Nyamgul Agadji. Thanks for joining us. The Nigeria Governors Forum, NGF, has described the claim by the federal government that governors are responsible for the rising poverty and economic hardship in the country as baseless. The forum, which consists of the 36 state governors, attributed high level of poverty to the federal government's failure to provide adequate security for lives and property. The NGF reacted to the federal government's claim that governors are responsible for rising poverty and economic hardship in the country through a statement by the Director of Media and Public Affairs, Abdul Razak Bello Barkindo, on Saturday, December 3. Reacting to the federal government's claims, the governor said they were not to blame for the high rate of poverty in the country. And joining us to discuss this is the governorship's candidate, of ADC in Akwaibom State and uh, Opunabo Inko Taria, civil rights advocate. We're glad to have Opunabo join us at this moment. Hello and welcome to Plus Politics. Good evening, Nagabi, and good evening, Nigeria. Okay, so let's let's just begin. How how does this allegation sound to you? True or false? The federal government is placing the blame squarely on the shoulders of the governors. It's, it's, it's fallacious. So, I mean, uh, not true at all. Membership, completely membership. Uh, first and foremost, I think when you talk of poverty and the land, the blame squarely rests at the doorsteps of the president. This is a president that promised that they were going to turn around the refineries if they failed to do. And if you also consider how much is being spent on exploration of good exportation and importation, which is rationally inexplicable, you realize that so much is being spent on the crude. And that is as a result of the cabal involved in this oil, excuse me, in cabal involved in the oil business. You have the cabal. That, and the federal government is also complicit. And that is why in seven years, despite his promise that within months it was going to turn around the maintained refinery, it has failed to so do. Then if you also talk of banditry, I mean, the federal government is in charge of security. Yes, we do agree that the state have uh, roles to play in terms of security. After all, the state governors also get their security votes, no doubt about that which uh, uh, is, is also not accounted for, and I'm also quite against that, because security votes should be accounted for. Because security votes are not accounted for, the governor uh, give, I mean, any amount they like for security votes. Some take as much as five billion, some as much as six billion. You see, we're well, this in the treasury. But the security squarely lies in the hands of Mr. President, and that is also part of it, because it also affects um, uh, food production. Most of the farmlands are deserted as a result of insecurity because of the abduction and kidnappings and killings that have been going on. And we also talk of the refineries, like I said earlier. Um, most of the companies are divesting, and we all know the consequences of divestment. When you talk of divestment, you find out that you have loss of jobs, and we all know the domino effect of loss of jobs. So uh, the federal government is to be blamed. Not that the states are going to be insulated, insulated from any blame, not at all. But the, the majority of the blame should go to the federal government. So because you have the giant triplex of one, um, insecurity, which is the case of banditry, the failure to turn around the maintenance, and the, non, the inertia of the part of government to diversify the economy. 
So when you put encapsulate all this, I, I, I encapsulate all this in cataclysmic leadership. It's a complete failure on the part of the Saudi government to address the Nigerian problem. And when you have these problems, take it or not, no nation with such problems will survive it. And so the poverty rate has moved from almost double, from about 80 something or thereabout to about 100 and something, 130 something, 130 million. And uh, the state governors, like I said, thought that they would be completely insulated, but the federal government takes a larger share of the blame. Okay, uh, let me go to the second guest we have here, Ezekiel Nyaito. Uh, you've just joined us. Um, the federal government, let me pose the same question to you. The federal government has said that the state government is responsible for the level of poverty that we have in Nigeria right now. We would like to also have your opinion, what your take is on that. Yeah, um, thanks for having me and uh, my brother again. Um, there are two Good sides. Yes, I like thank, you, sir. thank you, sir. There are two sides to this coin. I will tell you, and each of them has um, has a point. The very first thing is that when you talk in terms of poverty, it has to do with affecting people at the lowest level, and we have three tiers of government. You have the national or the federal government. You have the state government. You have the um, the last tier being the local government. Unfortunately, the local government exists on paper. Effectively, the state governments have handled the local government. Sorry, something has happened that is... Um, yeah, just I'm, go I'm ahead. Sure go ahead. Me. Go ahead. So just assume that... Um, that um, what do you call it? Assume that um, uh, it, uh, it, uh, it, um, it's a phone call, okay? Hmm. So the federal government, uh, the state government has completely um, removed the 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 the, state, the local government from any form of relevance, and to that extent, that um, level of government that relates with the people is ineffective. So there's a disconnect. But then, the state government will tell you that the federal government is responsible for the insecurity that has made the people unable to go to their farms, unable to do anything as a result, uh, that that insecurity is controlled by the federal government because they control the apparatus of, of um, you know, the policing of the state. And to that extent, yes, the, the federal government is um, held liable. But all said, it's about passing the buck. The reality is that the two of them have failed and I always bring up this, let me end on this note. I always bring this up at all times. People, you know, my brother just told you that our uh, poverty rate, we are effectively about 113 million out of a little over 200 million that are in abject poverty. Now, these governments do not have an understanding of the essence of government and governance. I could never quote this enough. Chapter 2, Section 14, subsection 2B states without any ambiguity what the matching order of government is. It states that the security and welfare of the people shall be the primary purpose of government. If you look at one, two, three words in that place, security and welfare of who? The people. When you talk of the people, we are talking of the generality of the people. And who are the generality of the poor? They are the poor, they are the physically challenged, they are the most vulnerable, they are the children, they are the women, they are the students. If the security and welfare of this group of people is the primary purpose of government, and when you talk of primary, primary is an English word, foundational, the fundamental, the principal uh, uh, essence of government, then you realize that we are running governance that really does not understand their matching order. Let me stop there for now. Yeah, but, but let me remain with you. Um, uh, yeah. You, you are gunning to become the governor of Aquaibom State under ADC. Yeah. And yeah. we're talking about the issue of security. And gov uh, governors always say that because security is a... What concerns the federal government, that's why they are not able to control. 
If you personally go into office as the governor of Akwaibom State, if you are lucky enough to get the votes of the people, will you also blame the federal government for the security or insecurity of your land? Or there's something you can do with whatever you yes. have to improve security? This is an amazing question. I'll come with a very practical answer as to what I am doing in Akwaibom State. At the risk of sounding immodest, I think I'm one of the few Nigerians dead or alive that has come up with a political ideology. This political ideology is what I call social governance ideology, which has seven fundamentals. Fundamental one says that social governance is a bottom-to-top approach to governance and development with the primary objective of bringing the citizens out of poverty. Now, that clearly demand, defines the matching order of governance that I just brought out, which is fundamental seven. He says that social governance is therefore the effective actualization of the core mandate of government, as clearly stated in the Constitution, that the security and welfare of the people shall be the primary purpose of government. Now, this is the part I want to bring out. Fundamental six says that social governance believe in massive investments in the rural areas for their development and transformation. So in line with that, what am I doing? I am investing, investing 500,000 Naira every month in every village for their development and transformation. Let me give you what the nexus is. Somebody will say, Abba, how are you going to do that? Number one, we have 2,226 villages in Akwaibom. And let me blow your mind. By the time you invest 500,000 in every village, you have spent just about 1.1 billion. And guess what? This is about half of what the government takes in Akwaibom State as security vote. I'm sure you understand where I'm coming from. Yeah, I'm, now. I'm listening. I'm listening. Yes. This is what I am using less than half or about half of what they call security vote. Imagine in your village that somebody invests. 500,000 Naira every month for four years. Now, it is not just investing. It's a well thought out and cut out plan. Number one, you have to open up all the village roads, just grading. It costs next to nothing. Number two, you have to do a maintenance of that road through the families where the women maintain the roads and they are on stipends. Number three, there are old women in that village. There are widows. They cannot move out. They are very old. You put them on social security service, even if it means paying them 5,000 Naira per month. So what have I done? I've brought in 500,000 Naira to stimulate the local economy. On account of that, there is going to be peace because people are now having a means of livelihood and don't have to do the uh, rural urban migration. If anything, somebody that has been driving keke in Uyo is going to say, why don't I go back to my village? Why don't I go into farming? Because the roads are opened up and there's keke, what they call keke in each of those places. They can carry my cassava to the market and then I'll be able to have something doing because we have a marketing board that picks up all the produce at the end of the day, I'm bringing very practical, very, very practical solution. Because when I say 500,000 Naira per, per month in every village, everybody's like, oh, come on, it's not possible. But now when I broke it down, people are like, wow, you mean governors have been collecting so much money and cannot use half to invest this much? We are starting to have what we call cerebral governance that is coming into play. And I think that every governor should start thinking outside the box instead of saying, oh, I can't do anything. And yet you call a security vote every month. What do you do with the security vote, I ask? Okay. Uh, well, um, that means what you have said is that it is, it is still within, uh, within, it's doable. Yeah, let me use that word. It's doable, doable. by the governors. It's they can doable. do something about security and not trade blames with the federal yes. government. Okay, if let me go. If you can't do something about security, why are you collecting security vote every month? Let, let me go to uh, uh, open our ball. Let me go to uh, open our ball. Um, well, let's look at this. You said that, uh, well, in fairness to you as well, you said that both of them are 
are going to share the blame for this. But federal government is not as close to the people as the state government. You said that yourself. And like they say, every general is as good as his lieutenants because the people that are around him are the ones that are supposed to make him look good. Do you think the federal government has failed in any of the, the responsibility uh, that is due the state that is making the state to complain? Because we see the state going to the federal government every now and then and getting what we see as they need to, keep, to put their states in order. But they still fail. Do you think that there are some well, things that the federal uh, government should have done that they are not doing? Well, um, there is complicity and dereliction of duty on the part of the federal government. I say complicity in the sense that when you talk of banditry, when you talk of oil theft, and when you talk of the refineries that are not working, mm. these are responsibilities of the federal government because uh, the federal government is in charge of security if we have to go by the Constitution. Nevertheless, so on that note, I mean, the federal government can be blamed mm. because it has failed to provide security <coughs> It is also complicit us in terms of the insecurity that is going on in the country. I mean, I can give an example. Take, for example, the former service chiefs, where their successors came out to say they could not even account for uh, the money allocated for the purchase of arms and ammunition. And these service chiefs were not punished. They were not penalized. Rather, they were promoted and made ambassadors. So, which is an endorsement on the, federal, on the part of the federal government for their, um, how would I put it, inefficiency, so to speak. Now, if you also talk of the refineries, it is the responsibility of the federal government to turn around those refineries and to a very large extent ensure that it creates an environment for oil companies rather than divest, for more oil companies to come into the country, and that will also create employment. But then, just like my brother rightly said, uh, the states cannot completely be isolated from this place. Why I say that is because, like I also said earlier, you have the security votes. A government that is sensitive, a government that is responsible and responsive, a government that is solicitor for the welfare of its people will do things like my brother rightly said. Let's take, for example, you cannot completely eliminate crime and criminality anywhere in the world, even in the United States of America, in Russia, and so on. You cannot completely eliminate it. But you can abate it. Now, how do you abate it? There is so much hunger in the land. And when a man is hungry, I am not trying to justify it. When a man is hungry, he resorts to various expedients, including crime, to survive. And that is what is going on. Now, if, for example, you have the security votes, governors always have this bad understanding of security votes, you know? It's crisis. And that's why a lot of them foment crisis. They stimulate the crisis. As well with their security aid. They see their chief security officers, their agencies, and so because it has become a great betray. Now, when they believe that whenever there is crisis, that is when you now have need for security votes. Not at all. The security vote can also save off crisis. You can assume violence. If, for example, you now take care, use that security vote, just like you rightly said, use that security vote to provide an enabling environment for the people in your state to grow and to do businesses, it will definitely reduce crime rate in that state. But most of the governors believe that the security vote is meant to purchase arms, is meant to purchase, uh, is meant to fight cri a crime. It's like, no, 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 that, that, that's the one understanding of what security vote is all about. It is called security vote. In other words, to combat crime and also prevent crime. That's why it is called security vote. But these governors today use that to feather or line their pockets. They don't spend it on security. That is it. But like I rightly said, both the federal government and the state government share in this blame. But majority stops at the door post of the federal government. Because it is the federal government that is in charge of security. The states are just chief, titular chief security officers. A state governor can call on the commissioner of police to do a thing, and if the commissioner of police likes, he will, he will. If he doesn't like, he will not. The state governor okay. has no power, no virus whatsoever to compel the CP to do whatever he wants to do. The army is not under his control, so he has, he, excuse me, his rights are circumscribed.
But it's not even a right. It's more or less a privilege. So that's okay, why well, it stops at the doorstep, principally at the federal government, but the states cannot be insulated from any blame. Okay, well, the major things you highlighted, both of you actually, uh, the functions of the federal government, things that they should have put in place, like the refineries, and also the fact that they own the security apparatus, so the state government cannot do that. But the states, or the ordinary man, let me not say the governors, because I haven't heard them say that much, are fighting for restructuring. And part of the restructuring, the call for restructuring, is the fact that everybody is talking about that every state should be able to control their own uh, wealth, as it were. And doing so, they will develop faster. But now we've seen a situation where, for instance, in the South-South, or the oil-producing states, we've heard that the Buhari administration gave the 13% derivation fund to all of them. And for a lot of states, we did not even see one thing that was being done to show that they collected the money. Do you think that states are strong enough, are ripe enough, are mature enough to stand on their own if we should advocate for uh, this uh, restructuring and it really comes to pass? Do you think they can survive? Or they oh, are going definitely. To manage? Oh, definitely. The states will survive. Uh, except the parasitic states, you know. But fortunately enough, in this country, every state is blessed with one resource or the other. So the states will survive. All they need to do is harness their resources. And that is why we talk of restructuring. When we talk of restructuring, it has to start with from the legal aspect of it. We are states will be allowed to explore and harness their resources and sell. Because every state is blessed with one major resource or the other. Now, I haven't, I haven't said this. You see, when you say um, the states have their money, Yes, you might have the money. You might not invest the money in the uh, social, in the human capital development, and what have you. But you're not in charge of security. And that's why we talk of restructuring. Now, when you talk of restructuring, that is where you have a centrifugal system of government as against a centrifugal system of government. A situation where the states, to a very large extent, just like when, you had in the, when you, we had the regions, to a very large extent, will have the state police, although they fear is that there are some tyrants who are governors and will abuse that. But fine, these are democratic principles here, and there is nothing you can do about it. Gradually, we'll also have very strong institutions that will ensure that the governors don't abuse the power. It's a gradual process. But okay. when you talk of restructuring, for mm -hmm. example, now you have the regions. If you realize when we have the regions, the developers will have faster because there was some partial autonomy. Mm. Now, the issue of the derivation we are talking about, the reverse could have been the case. It would have been the states having their money and paying taxes to the centre. That would have been the case. But most importantly, I need to highlight this. Most importantly, it really, really has to do with the character of the person in office. A situation where you have people with distorted perception of life accidentally discharged onto the political surface, you find out that you're going to have these issues. Because a lot of them, excuse me, a lot of them are in office to lord it over. So it is no longer a situation of the government. It's now a relationship between a lord master, a, a, a lead master, and that of an elite servant. That is what you have right now. You know, once you're a governor, you believe that you're in charge, you take control, you do everything. That shouldn't be the case. And don't amount what kind of life you put in place. It has to do with the character, that person that has been elected into office. He doesn't, his own perception of life is different. It's slanted. And so when he gets into he thinks he's now God. You can imagine certain governors telling you, I, 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 if okay. this, I'll do this, I'll do this. You don't tell me. You, know, you can find that kind of thinking. Okay. So he believes that even the resources coming to the state belong to him and not to the people. So he does whatever he wants to do. Sadly, even the state houses of assembly. And like, I, refer, I refer to them as Minister of Lawmaking attached to the executive arm, because the state houses of assembly cannot, they will never dare the government. If they did, the speaker does it, they will be impeached and removed the next day. Any member will be suspended. The government doesn't engineer it. So that is the problem we're having. So we so, need so there to is fear, there is fear that when there is too much, there's fear that the, when there is too much, uh, or if there is too much power in the states, they could also abuse these powers. 
Well, I just said it. No, like I just said, I said one, it depends on the individual. That yeah. is number one. Then, no, yes. Then no, number two, again, the autonomy of the House of Assembly is crucial. And that's why I like this givers and so on. It's evolving. Because what really goes on right now is that the assembly that is supposed to checkmate the executive has failed in this duty. Why? It is the government that will have big members of the assembly. Okay, let, let me go to... Uh, and it is the government can also engineer their removal. Yeah, let me go to so Ezekiel, who is, who is aspiring... Give us now, you are free to elect whoever you want, and somebody that will be there in your own image, yes. and not somebody that will be there to represent the governor. Because let me go to, a, let me go to Ezekiel that, that is aspiring to become a governor. Just, just a moment. Let me go to Ezekiel that is aspiring to become a governor. We're talking about this autonomy here, and um, yes. it's something that may not happen if, even if you become the governor of Aquaibom State now. It may not happen yes. in your tenure. Yes. But there has to be a difference. Even when Nigeria was asking for independence. Some people were not ready, so they had to yeah. delay it. We know all this, this story. Yeah. You need to show yeah. walking before independence can come yeah. to you. What can you do as a governor? And what can your brother governors, if, if you are elected among others that will be elected and sworn in in May, what yes. can be yeah. done okay, to are, show? They are, they are, yes. yes. I, I want to start from restructuring. And this might shock my brother a little bit. I am not as enthusiastic about restructuring a lot of times as people would expect me to be. I want to imagine an acquire bomb where there is no oil. And as a result, the agriculture that I undertake, the federal government is taking nothing from me. The ICT that is there, and if you handle it well, it would become a heavy money spinner. It is there for you, and the federal government is taking nothing from you. There are so many factors. The blue economy that is there within reasonable limits, okay? You have control over the certain level of waterways, which allows you to explore the blue economy. The federal government is not as passionate about it outside of the oil that we all think about. And then, of course, the mineral resources, where they are not even being bothered in the north. So at the end of the day, you are talking in terms of control of state police. And I ask myself, isn't it possible for me to get around? I'm talking about Aquaibum particularly. I tend to think that this silver bullet called restructuring might come as you know, the change that we expected from we expected from APC. And at the end of the day, you want a change. When you see change, you can't shout. Okay, so that, that said, <laughs> let's go to what can be done. Yeah, very, very today. fast now, please. Just let's wrap yes. up. Yeah. Yes. The very first thing is that we are having bag dogs that we are expecting to meow or cats that we are expecting to bark. The problem is not with the dog that cannot meow or the cat that cannot back. The problem is with you and, as, as an individual who has the senses to know that a, a dog will always back and a cat will always meow, and yet you want an ex opposite. Why am I saying this? You know the people that you are voting for. Right now is a campaign season. You know when where Buhari wanted to be president, you saw that picture of him with suit and tie. You also saw that picture of him in Igbo regalia. And nobody asked, dared to ask, is this a man that dresses this way? No, he dressed for the occasion, which is to pick your vote. And when he's picked your vote, he's going to be who he's been. So I think that the time has come when Nigerians should not react for the moment. Sentiment is as if there's a spell cast over the minds of people. Go and find out who Nyaitok has been over the past 20 years. Is he industrious? Is he somebody that believes in integrity? Okay. Is he an <laughs> honest person? He is, is he somebody that's passionate about the people? Is he somebody that has been able to contribute to the affairs of state while he was just an ordinary citizen? Who Nyaitok has been before election is what who he will be after election okay. and not who he is during election. Right. I think we need to open up 
and make sure that the people that we elect into power are the people we would like to wake up and see when the morning comes. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, well, gentlemen, this is how we wrap up on this uh, segment of the program. I'd like to thank you for being a part of the program. Ezekiel Nyaitok, governorship candidate under the ADC for Akwaibom State, and Mr. Opunabo Inko Taria, civil rights advocate. I'm very, very happy that you were able to make it to the program today. Thank you so much for coming. What a pleasure Thank and privilege. You. Thanks for having us. Okay. Thank you. So, uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, th thank you for staying with us. We'll take a short break now, and when we return, we'll be taking a look at former President Olusegun Obasanjo's statement on emotions, uh, especially now that uh, the last speaker just uh, talked about voting with sentiment. Obasanjo also said something about Nigerians choosing not to vote uh, due to emotions and what may cause Nigerian political space uh, a lot of stress uh, tomorrow. So let's take that break. When we return, we'll be talking with yet another guest who will be addressing this issue. Stay with us.